I'm Gwen Dawson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Real Property at the Authority. And it is so nice to see all of you here, and I want to express our sincere thanks, gratitude uh, for your spending some time with us this evening, a couple of hours, to uh, share with us your thoughts and ideas and to get a little bit more information about what we've been doing um, since the last time we were together in advancing this critical project. Um, uh, our design team has been working um, very diligently to put together a great presentation for you. I know you've seen, had the chance to see a few of the pieces of that out in uh, the hallway coming in. Uh, you'll get to see a lot more and they're going to do their uh, very best to answer your questions and to uh, have you go away this evening feeling that you've uh, gotten a, a really good picture of, of where we are. Uh, so, without further ado, I will turn it over to Nora Madonic, who's going to be our Master of Ceremonies for the evening. Thank you, Gwen. And hi, everybody. I'm glad to see everyone here tonight. And, and I want to say hello to everybody who is joining us online. We are live streaming as well. So, tonight is our 10th community meeting um, in June. We shared an update about the 30% design milestone for the project. And since that time, the project team has been working to advance the design even further. Um, they've been doing an analysis. They've been working with um, stakeholders and, of course, considering public input, which we have collected in meetings, in site walks, and from the emails that you have sent us online. So tonight's meeting is going to focus on post 30% design. So we'll be looking at an update there. And while updates have been completed in all of the reaches, we're going to be focusing on three tonight. The three that we'll focus on are reach one, and the team is going to share an update on the alignment along Route 9A and the 9A crossing. Um, they'll also present an updated focus on the east side alignment. For reach two, they will be sharing a revised extension that will accommodate future adapt adaptability and circulation. And for reach five, they'll be sharing an update about coordination with the Port Authority as well as design considerations at North Cove Marina. Um, after the presentation, the presentation will be about 40 minutes, and after the presentation we'll do a Q&A. It won't be a long Q&A because we have something even after that. Um, but we do want to hear from you. So we left for your convenience, if you'd like to use them, um, cards that it, it, as something comes to you during the presentation, you may want to jot down what you want to ask. Um, at the point at which we do a Q&A, we'll have someone coming around with a microphone. You'll be able to ask your question, and we'll answer as many as we can. We would ask you to keep it as brief as you can um, so we can get to as many people as possible. If you're participating virtually today, um, we'll be collecting the written comments from you uh, using the Q&A. Uh, there's a Q&A feature on your Zoom. So please put your comments in there. We'll be collecting them. They'll be sent to me, and I'll be reading them here. Um, so we're going to get started. And after the Q&A, we're going to break up to take a look at some tables. Um, we have table topics on three topics, and you'll be able to visit the tables and talk with the project team in more depth uh, about topics that have been of an interest in particular to the public that we've heard from. Um, I'll be back and remind you about how we'll handle the Q&A, but for now I'm going to hand things over to Peter. He's going to take us on a walk through where we are in post 30%. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening everybody. My name is Peter Gloss. I'm with the design team here for the project. And what we're going to do right now is go through a number of slides which have a lot of images and representations of the project. Um, I actually have about 165 slides, so I'm going to try to move through them fairly quickly so that we can get to some Q&A here and then afterwards leave you some time to go to the stations over there to talk about specific projects. 
Um, so my, my ask is if you have questions on the material that I'm presenting, if you can wait till I conclude the presentation and then we'll have 20 minutes for some open Q&A and then we can continue to have Q&A after this or in the tables themselves. So. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, uh, this is the identification of the team members, the Battery Park City Authority as the owner with their advisors, AECOM, One Architecture, and AKRF. The design build team is the Turner E. Cruz joint venture, as well as Arcadis, which is us, and some of our partners, Big Scape and WSP. And the agenda, as Nora had said, you know, we had the exhibit, ex exhibition area open to the public, the overview presentation, which is this, some Q&A, and then the table discussions that are really very specific to some of the topics that we've heard at the numerous community interactions that we've had over the past 12 to 18 months on the project in context, risk and adaptability and drainage, and all about the trees. So here's a project schedule that shows the development of the design of the project. And right now, we're at the first part of the 60% phase. We've passed the 30% milestone. And right now, we're beginning to go into more details on the project elements. And we're progressing through the 60% stage. At that point, we get to what we call final design, where we actually prepare construction documents. And then that goes into construction sometime in 2025. So let me get into the material. Um, as we have discussed over, so let me get into the material. Um, as we have discussed over the course of our engagement, we've broken the project up into these seven reaches. It is one singular project, but because each of the areas has sort of unique characteristics, we've broken them up in these reaches for technical ease to, to make it a little bit more digestible for us and for you folks as well. As Nora said, we really want to specifically talk about reaches one, two, and five, because those reaches represent a fairly significant amount of change from some of the original concepts that we've shown you as a reflection of the feedback that we've received from you on some of the design choices that we've made. We still are going to talk about reaches four, three, six, and seven, because we want to give you, again, a sense of where they are. There's been some minor adjustments to those as well, and we wanted to show you the latest there. We show this image a lot, which is the reason why the project is in motion, because it shows the vulnerability of the area to the design storm, the 100-year return period cycle with two and a half feet of climate change. And we can talk more about this. Any questions on the hydraulics, the hydrodynamics, the rainfall, the climate change, and the cloudburst, we will talk about at the risk and adaptability table. So I welcome any comments on that. And now let's go reach by reach. OK, so reach one, we're starting off on North Moore Street. And the highlighted area shows how we define that reach. We've heard a lot of feedback from the community. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of clarity that was requested of us at the flood barrier system tiebacks at Greenwich Street. Trees, of course, were noted as a valuable resource. Um, pedestrian clearances are important. The views to the Hudson River Park from 9A are valued, and you'll see a significant change in our design to address that comment. And then concerns about alignment adjacent to the bike lane. So here we are coming around Greenwich, going down Northmore, and then going on 9A. And you can see effectively the project elements hug the building. We, we were debating different places to put these elements. We got a lot of feedback from you folks, and we settled on aligning them with the building facade as a way to best match the current built environment. And here's some pictures of the before and after to give you a sense of that. When I show these images, I'm going to always show a series of three images. The first image is going to be like the photo today. The second image is going to highlight what is going to change. And then the third image is, is going to represent that change. So let's, let's, let's try that. So here's the today. Here's what's going to change, sort of like watch that space. And here's what we're proposing. So that's the pattern that you're going to see throughout this presentation. And you can see, like I said, the project elements are aligning themselves with the building so that, again, we match 
best the current built environment so that the project is um, <coughs> creates the least minimal impact on the physical and the environment of folks who work and live and walk there. Another shot, existing. That's where the product is going to go. And again, the proposed product itself. I want to note that um, the the surface treatments of those elements have not been designed yet, so it's not going to be looking like a monolithic concrete pour. It's going to be looking like something that has architectural elements on it, but we're not there yet in the design because we're only in the 60% early phase. Here's another shot. And now we're coming around and going down 9A. Now there's a, represent there's a large change that's represented here. As many of you know, we've talked a lot about initially the project being on the west side of 9A, adjacent to the Greenway. We got a lot of feedback about you know, the view impacts that that would have on the view quarters across 9A and the issues of adjacency between that and the bike path. So we've shifted the alignment so that it is now on the east side of 9A, hugging along BMCC, <coughs> crossing Harrison, and continuing to hug along BMCC. I'll also note that the crossing was pushed south in order to minimize the impacts that people are enjoy today about the views. So here's some shots of BMCC existing. There's where they're going to go. And that's the representation. Exist, uh, the existing, and actually this is a combo. There's where they're going to go. And then the representation, and again existing. Here's where we're going to go, and the representation. Again, building the project elements adjacent to the buildings, literally, so that we're minimally changing the current physical environment that people experience and walk through and live in. Now let's shift to Reach 2. Reach 2 is you know, uh, it's right out there, right, right outside near uh, at Stai. And Reach 2 is interesting for us because that esplanade out there is essentially a deck. It's like a platform deck that's suspended above water. When you walk on that esplanade, you're walking above water because the water is beneath the concrete deck that you're walking on. So for us to modify that deck, we have to take the whole deck off and reconstruct the deck because the deck wasn't designed to handle the project elements that we're proposing. We heard a lot about this reach, you know, the, 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 the pedestrian pinch point where the North Esplanade meets Hudson River Park. Lots of concerns about cyclists, and pedestrians, and the conflicts that could be coming from the proximity, the close proximity of those two user groups. You know, seepage between the flood barrier system and the building, trees and vegetation, um, amenities in the area, and then um, maintaining the egress to the school and maintaining and improving universal access and ADA accessibility. So this is the project in bird's eye view as currently conceived. You can see this is the existing and there's an extension here of six feet where we're going into the water six feet as a cantilevered platform. And that extension is designed to help this particular reach be more adaptable in the future. And again, I can talk a lot about that more in the table, but that's the rationale for that six foot extension. And you can see that then, based upon that footprint, we've designed some curvature. So you can see how we approach the, the uh, design of the surface elements um, on the new Esplanade that has that slight expansion of six feet. We've put some curvature to the path, and we've tried here, like in all the areas of the project, to increase green space, plantings, um, and, and, and a sense of, you know, we want to get away from concrete, we want to move towards green. At every opportunity we have, we're going to take those opportunities to create areas for greening and planting. And this is a good example of that, where on the south side of the curved path, we're going to be putting those green buffers, and on the north side of the green path, we're looking to plant a line of trees. 
because we recognize that this area right now um, has green and we want to replace it with green and try to improve on that. And a lot of project areas on the authority's property have wonderful green spaces and we want to do our best to avoid changing them and where we can, increasing green space where possible. So here's some shots. This is the, cur this is the corner right now that's currently in existence. There's the project elements that are going to be going. And there's the shot. So again, just so that we're clear, the project elements sit against and adjacent to the high school. They're not in the esplanade. So that's why they're difficult to see because they're effectively hidden by being set up against the Stuyvesant High School walls. They're not structurally touching the high school, but they're adjacent to the high school. So another shot existing. There's where it's gonna go. And here's the final. Again, you can see to the right, you can see some of the opportunities that we're creating for trees, green space, plantings. Existing, there's the elements. Again, taking opportunity to create tree canopy, green space, plantings, as much as we can when we create those spaces along the project elements. The corner. Here's the shot of the corner proposed. We changed the angle, so that's the corner, right? You can see that. And then here's the area where the maintenance um, facility door is. And you can see here, again, we're trying to do our best to, again, continue that green theme with plantings and trees. Now we're going to go through Rockefeller Park. Rockefeller Park, as we define it technically here. And we've heard a lot. Uh, feedback at Rockefeller Park, you know, the importance of protecting trees along River Terrace, the views, protecting the views. The views are very important. And, you know, appreciation for existing plantings in the pollinator garden, right? So here's the plan we have. Um, and you can see the project elements begin sort of halfway through the park and continue along. And we follow the existing wall that goes along River Terrace because we're trying to match the existing built environment to minimize the change that the project is creating for people, for pedestrians, and for user experience. Right? Is existing, the ball courts. There's the project element, which is, again, over there behind it. And here's the new ball court. So you can see in the background there, the project elements. Here's the existing wall, which the top of the wall is at 15.75, 15.75 from the surface of the ocean, right? So when we see numbers on these slides, it's the numbers from the surface of the ocean, not from the ground, just so that we're all clear. So that's 15.75 from the surface of the ocean. There's the new wall, shifted and slightly offset. And then there's the new wall. So it went from 15.75 to 16.5. So it went up a bit less than a foot. But again, you can see here, here as well, we're taking opportunities to create green space and planting space. Here's more shots of the playground, which is a place where we got a lot of feedback from. The flood, the project elements are on the east side of the playground. You can see that here. That particular wall there is at 14 and a half. There's the project elements. The new wall is going to be at 16 and a half. Belvedere Plaza. Let's go through Belvedere Plaza, Reach 4. We, got a, we had a lot of conversation with many of you about the Lily Pond and the ferry terminal. The ferry terminal is not going to change its location. The project team has worked with the Port Authority to come up with a way to design the project while leaving the ferry terminal exactly in place without moving it to the north or to the south because we got a lot of feedback on the ferry terminal and the, the, the opportunities to move that or from north or south. So we leave it right there. And we also got a lot of feedback on the lily pond. And that's a beloved feature, I know, by many of you in the community. And so that's also being um, left more or less in place intact. And we're building around these elements. Um, what we've heard, uh, again, interested in more plantings, less pavings, um, um, balancing plantings with 
you know, activities and programs, particularly at the Irish uh, Hunger Memorial Plaza. Um, better understand the height and the visual presence of the wall in front of the Hunger Memorial and 300 Vesey. And interest in better accommodated existing queuing needs at the ferry terminal. So how we've responded to that feedback, you can see here's our plan, where the project elements go, like I said, on the east side of the lily pond, and the wall is integrated into plantings and the greenery, that, and we're actually creating greenery and plantings by putting the wall there. So here's some shots of that. Here's sort of the aerial shot. There's the Hunger Memorial on this side. Here's existing, there's the project elements, and that's what, what you, you can't see them, of course, because they're hidden by the plantings, but that's by design, right? Because we want to make this an area where people are experiencing the green and the plantings and not the wall. There's the plan for the ferry terminal area. Existing. This is the area that is going to contain the, wall, the project elements. And again, you can see here, we've taken a lot of, we've put a lot of thought into trying to create green here because this area was not particularly green in its existing configuration. And then these are the views I mentioned before. We were very concerned about some of the views by some of the ground floor commercial uses and tenants. So this is an example of the views from 300 Vesey. That's the project element that will go in front of their facade. And this is what we're envisioning the final construction to look like. Um, again, another shot near the Terry Terminal. Now I want to point out here that one of the things that we're doing, I don't know if you can see it here, is there's this dotted line that's a white. These areas currently sit on platforms. So to construct what we're constructing, we have to reconstruct the platforms. Because we're reconstructing the platforms, we're going to elevate the platforms. And that's going to give us a flood protection benefit. And we're going to taper those elevated areas very gradually so that they kind of dovetail into the existing grades. Now let's go to Reach 5, North Cove. A lot going on in Reach 5. We have Belvedere Plaza, we have Pump House Park. What we heard, we heard a lot. We heard about views in public space as a priority, um, protecting as many mature trees as possible. That was a huge theme in Reach 5. Um, we got some feedback about you know, switchbacks, too many switchbacks, um, very difficult for you know, accessibility because it has a very blocky architecture that was you know, uh, appropriate for the time. Um, Again, a lot of hard, hardscape, not a lot of shade in certain areas. Um, and then, you know, just being very mindful of the programming and the planned events that take place in that area throughout the year. Um, and of course, the dining terraces and the area in particular between the project elements and Pump House Park. So let's walk through this. So this is where our project elements align. We're trying to put our project elements on the high side of the esplanade to minimize their impact and to blend in with the uses in the upper esplanade. So let's talk about this. This is a good example as we turn Vesey and go into Belvedere Plaza. This is Belvedere Plaza right now. And we, we're, we're, we really thought long and hard about how to maintain those trees and protect those trees and minimize our impact to those trees. So the project elements are going to be going there. And so this is how we're representing the final design. We're minimizing the impact to the trees in Belvedere Plaza and the project element is going to be experienced as, as seeding. I think someone could actually walk into this area and just think of it as a unique seating arrangement as opposed to something that was designed to protect from a flood. And that's the intent of what we're trying to do here. There are openings for egress, and we've taken a lot of opportunity to put adjacent to the project elements 
plantings and greenery and vegetation to make this area more green and um, um, softer in that sense. Here's an area in um, um, Reach 5, the step down section. There's where the project elements are going to go. And you can see, you actually, you really can't see. We've changed the angle a little bit to, to, to focus on a, sort of a better shot of this. But you can see the elements are sort of hard to distinguish from the eye. But what is easy to distinguish is the increase in amplification of the green spaces and the landscaping. Another shot of Belvedere Plaza. There's the elements. And again, the seating configuration. As we come and come down to Waterfront Plaza, here's an existing shot of the Winter Garden. And again, you can see the, you know, we all are familiar with you know, the blocky architecture that's, you know, there. That's not, not particularly accessible um, and doesn't meet what we want it to meet for universal access. Here's where the project elements are going to go. And here's what we propose as the final condition. So you can see there's um, much better accessibility and a significant effort to improve the canopy and the vegetative cover and the plantings and landscape in this area, which is currently right now dominated by stone type concrete structures. The dining area in Reach 5, there's the elements, there's the top of wall. We work really hard to keep that top of wall such that you can be sitting on one of those tables and you can still see the water. Again, another shot. There's the area that represents the project. And you can see here's a shot that shoots along. So again, we're, we're taking great care to make the wall part of an overall landscaping and architected element. And we're taking every opportunity to increase the green coverage and the plantings in this area as well. The plaza, the elements, and again, here's a shot. From the winter garden, the elements, and there's the shot. The terrace at Ley District, the elements themselves, and the shot here. And showing that we're doing our best to take, um, to, to, to understand the usage of the dining areas and the sensitivity of those customers and the people who sit there to the views that they are currently used to, you know, and trying to maintain as much of that as possible. Now we're going to Pump House Park. So this is where the project gets, I'm doing pretty good at 24 minutes. I have 20 minutes left and I think I'm more than halfway through. So this gets a little more technical here. So. Pump House Park is in some ways defined by what's taking place underground, not by what's taking place on top of the ground. You can't really see it here, but I'll show this in later slides. There's a box here. This box represents the bridging structure, structure that's necessary to build underneath the esplanade to prevent the water from going up the path tunnel surfaces and hitting West Street. So underneath that box is this. It's a fairly, this is what we call the bridging structure. We call it a bridging structure because it's sort of like a bridge. But basically, all this is below the esplanade. And that structure is going to prevent the water from going underneath the esplanade platforms and during a surge event coming up through the platforms and flooding Brookfield and flooding the path station and everything else like has occurred during Sandy. That's a significant technical part of the project and is pr probably one of the most difficult parts of the project to build. And um, part of the reason why we're talking about Reach 5 today is because we have significant coordination with the Port Authority to discuss with them how we're going to build this thing and straddle their path tube that goes underneath it. Because obviously, they have some significant concerns about the impacts that our project will have on the stability of the path tube. A lot of technical conversations back and forth with them. Again, this is just showing the areas that are, that are above water again. 
and this is just another shot that just shows this bridging structure right here. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna recap because this is a really important point. A lot of this design is defined by this. And this is something that we don't have a lot of liberty to move back. We can't move it this way or that way because we have to be on top of the path tube. We can't move it this way or that way because there's only a certain place we can cross that path tube. So this box and this structure really set the table for how we have to deal with what's taking place on the surface. So here's the surface. And all that, what I just discussed, is underneath this now, right? So there's the existing retaining wall. And this is the, where the project elements will sit. And this is our concept of um, what the final construction will be. You can see those elements. And what we've done is we've created a direct connection to Pump House Park to the Esplanade. And we've created a system of ramps so that that Esplanade entrance is accessible and, and meets universal access requirements. We've also taken an opportunity to put as much green as we can on that because we don't want people to experience any type, any sense in any location that there's an overwhelming concrete you know, feature. Here's the police memorial area. This, this also, because it sort of straddles onto that bridging structure, is technically complicated as well and is affected by the underground construction. This is where the project elements are going to go. This is also an area that has a fair amount of trees. And so this is the proposed final design. And, um, I, and again, we'll, you can talk more about this in the tree table, but you know, I'm going to say 14 or 15 trees are going to be impacted by this project because this alignment is where it is, and that thing below grade has to be where it is. Now we're coming around to the Kowalski Plaza, Plaza, sorry. And this is the existing. That's where the elements are going to be, off to the side. And this is our proposed concept. Which matches the existing privacy wall and has more or less at the same height. So there's not a significant change to the, you know, to the to the experience of people in the physical built environment, right? Breach six. We, we call this Breach Six. You you know it as the South Esplanade. It's a wonderful place to walk and run, beautiful place to see the sunset. And Reach Six has um, um, lots of different elements, which we'll get into here. Um, we heard a lot of feedback. We heard a lot of feedback about doing our best to protect these trees, providing equal or additional vegetation. What's going to happen to the art stations? Um, and you know, a, a couple of the pieces are very valued by the community. Uh, you know, the pr previous design, we got some feedback, had too much meander. So we straightened it out a bit because the feedback that we got was that it meandered too much. Um, you know, how are you going to be handling the openings in the project elements, the flood protection system, and you know, how is this going to affect the views from the residents on the ground floors and programs at end nodes? So here's some before and after shots. There's the existing with the, I think it's the pickleball court. Volleyball? Okay, sorry. I don't play pickleball, so I don't know. <laughs> um, there's the uh, project elements. And here's a shot again which shows the project elements and it shows our concepts of increasing the vegetation, the planting, and the canopy in this area, which could be particularly hot in the summer. As we go around and near the gateway apartments, the gateway apartments, I would add, are technically unique because part of these apartments actually sticks out over the water. Like when the Battery Park was built as an authority back in the day in the 70s, there was a bulkhead. For whatever the reason that I don't know, this particular apartment building chose to build over the bulkhead and cantilever over the water. So that presents for us a technical challenge that we're, we, we are solving by sort of adapting to that extension over the bulkhead. Here's um, Gateway Plaza and we're in um, a lot of conversation about how to approach this with Gateway Plaza and make this perform as we need to, but at the same time minimize the impact 
to the people in Gateway Plaza. Here's some of the shots along Reach 6, Albany Street, the, uh, the, the, the street end there. There's the project elements that are going along the left side there. And here's a shot of that. Yeah, the, the rendering got a little closer to this corner, so we didn't pull it out. I mean, it, that, one of the things we're trying to do is have all the renderings match an exact frame. It's technically difficult to do, but we're doing our best to make those match. Well, again, we're, we're, there's a lot of conversation still in terms of the developing this. And right now, we have been busy evaluating a number of different options. You can see two of the options that we're representing here is a solid flood barrier system. And just to point out a bit of a nuanced detail, it's a solid passive barrier system with a recurve element on top. That's an option. The other option we're looking at, of course, is a system that has deployables that tries to minimize the disruption of the views from the courtyard area across and into the Hudson. Again, themes. There's what the product elements are. And here's the proposed configuration at the street end. Here's the Regatta residences. The wall effectively matches the current privacy wall and elevation and is built in that alignment. And this is something that the design team and the authority have come up with. We call these program locations where at the street ends, we want to reflect sort of a program use, nature play, conversation room, and leisure lawn. And these are just some images of those proposed concepts, existing, leisure lawn, conversation room, existing, proposed, and the nature play. So now we shift to Reach 7, the South Cove. Um, the South Cove area, we've heard a lot from the feedback, uh, from the community feedback, um, you know, about the importance of protecting the grove. The importance of protecting the grove, right? That's a beloved grove. An appreciation for a quiet, contemplative seating area along the water's edge. Again, the importance of preserving views and the interest in maintaining and, if possible, expanding circulation areas to avoid pinch points. So this is the current plan where the project elements hug along the regatta and hug along here. And we have very deliberately tried to move away from the grove so that we minimize impact on those trees. So here's some shots. This is an aerial view, just a sort of a broad view of the area. Here's the existing on the corner. And this is the proposed image on the corner. And you can discuss this at length more with our colleagues in SCAPE. There's, there's design rationale for the plantings here and how they tie into the Mary Miss installation. Here's a shot of the lower ramp. Here's the project elements. And here's our, here's our proposed project. The deployables in this particular configuration are, are deployables that will come up from the ground and slide into place during a storm. We spent a lot of time discussing how we're going to do our best to protect that building so that it performs like we need it to perform, but to minimize the impact of that building by using this particular deployable configuration. And these are some just companion views of the views from the south end. You can see here crossing the street, we have a flip up that comes up out of the ground in this location. You can't really see it, but it's right there. And here's another shot of the view from the street where the top of wall existing and proposed. 
And here's another shot of uh, second place where the existing and the proposed. Yes, I, I, I think there's a couple different interventions being used to cover those openings. In some cases, it's slide gates. In some cases, it's gates. In some cases, it's deployables. So we are at the end of the images, and now it's time for Q&A. Okay, so um, I just want to go over again what we're going to do here. Um, we have folks online and we have folks who are in the audience right now. So for those of you who are um, listening via live stream, participating in that way, please put your questions in the Q&A. I see we have some lined up already. Um, I'll be going back and forth between people who are here in person and people who are participating virtually. Um, would ask you please to try to keep it short so that we can get to everyone. Um, we have people in the audience uh, staff who have um, microphones. So Caroline, let's start with you with this gentleman right here in the blue. Uh, talk a little bit about the deployables, especially on the south esplanade down to South Cove. You talked about a deployable coming up from the ground at South Cove. What's going to happen on the other streets? I realize there's a constraint in building it into uh, uh, treatments that look natural, but obviously one that's that are out of sight and doesn't leave the neighborhood feeling like it's in a prison on Albany, Thames, Rector, and the other ones. So that's one question. Same question, though, is what are are you incorporating the current privacy walls or are you building new walls in front of them? Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, I don't have a slide that um, has like all different types of deployables, but let me try to get to um, um, here. Like this is a good example. So at the outset, our goal is to build a project that's reliable and robust, easy to maintain, and easy to put in place prior to a storm. Generally, that's best when the elements are passive and we don't have to press any buttons or move anything in place or mobilize any people to do anything. Because of the, obviously the unique nature of the authority and its property and its land uses, um, we have in a number of locations in the project, deployable elements that are basically sort of, I'm going to say, fit for purpose. Like this is a good example. Um, we have a deployable gate that is in the ground right here at the end of South End Avenue. That's a great location for a deployable because it doesn't get a lot of heavy vehicular traffic. And so, and it's not going to be, it's probably not going to be whacked by a snowplow. So, you know, we're generally comfortable that that's going to remain mechanically intact. So when we need it, we can, you know, press the mechanism and the thing will flip up and it'll act as a protection. What's also great about that location, it's already starting from a little bit of a high elevation. So the thing that's coming up doesn't have to be six, seven, eight feet. Then there are other areas in a project where the height of the deployable is much higher. And so, um, let me give you an example. The, um, the crossing of the street that splits BMCC, I believe that's Hudson. Harris, Harris, sorry. That's a very high design height. So for that, we're looking at a couple different interventions, but it's unlikely that a deployable could work there because of the height that's required and the exposure of that location to the water. So in that case, we're considering a number of different things, but we're also considering gates that swing into place that have, yes, gates have an obvious visible presence when they're not being used and they're in storage position. However, gates certainly are robust at heights that are higher than the deployable elements, and they rotate into place quite easily. So, you know, really each deployable that we've chosen to use has sort of a story behind why we've used it in that place. And you know, we can talk more about that because actually I've got a whole bunch of slides on risk and adaptability on that desk. So I'm just giving you like a, uh, encouraging people to, who want to talk about that to head over to that desk during a breakout session. 
Okay. Oh, the so one to the right. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you about those in a second. Yeah. Um, but, I'm going to jump. He had a second question. You had a second question. Yes, that's privacy correct. Walls. Right, right, right. We are the the privacy wall right now in in Reach Six is designed to hold itself, but it's not designed to hold flood waters and hydrostatic pressure. So what we're doing in Reach Six is we're reconstructing that wall so that it is engineered to hold back the water pressures that will be felt by it during a surge event. The current wall is. Yes, it's basically a replacement, yes. yes. Um, I'm going to switch to somebody online. Um, I found it hard to tell from the images, but is there any loss of space to Hudson River Park? Particularly, does the platform on the north side of Stuyvesant take space from the marina on the south side of Pier 25? Okay, I will answer that question, but I'm also trying to avoid that feedback sound, but now I'm in the middle of the projector. Um, Yes, so remember I talked about that six foot extension? So the rationale there is reach two is a very narrow piece of the project. And it's a complete reconstruction of that platform. So when we redesign and construct that, coming back 30 years from now, it'll be very difficult to change it because you don't have a lot to work with. So what the authority and, 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 and our team have done is said, we want this product to be adaptable in the future. So what we're doing is we're extending that platform six feet out over HRPT waters, and we're creating an opportunity for that six feet to hold a small, what we call a parapet wall or a knee wall, that can be used to attenuate and dampen surge from future events. That will be in constructed if necessary in the future, but now we have an opportunity at least to build it. If we had to build a parapet wall on the current platform without expanding it, we'd be cutting into the platform, the pedestrian path, and the circulation. That's why we're extending out six feet over HRPT waters. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're not touching Pier 25. Yes, the, it was the question, I guess, oh, so, well, if the question was, are we touching Pier 25? No, no, we're only going six feet north from the current boundary of the Esplanade. platform, right? So there's an existing platform and then there's new platform and that's the difference, right? Here, okay. It's hard to see, but this pink line is the edge of the current platform. The extension is in this sort of brown zone. The blue shaded area is just the area that we're delineating as the zone where construction activity will take place temporarily during the construction. But the finished product per se, the physical built structure, is gonna be six feet out from the current edge. So said, said even more, this edge right here, it's gonna be six feet this way, All right? Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm making you bend. Um, so. Thank you for the presentation. It was really helpful, and thanks for the additions of the in-between slides. They were helpful. Um, I just want to make a note again that we really need to talk more about reaches six and seven in more detail. Not, and five too, okay, five too, but five, six, and seven, because there's lots of things that are in there that I think the community, as a, a, a broader community than just the people who came to the walkthroughs, mm -hmm. um, uh, would want to opine on and, and, and have input on. And I'm really grateful, not about where the wall is, that's, you know, I know that's not up for grabs, but what, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna put in place? And um, I again invite you to the um, January or March Battery Park City Committee to do those reaches as your convenience, because I really think it's important. Yeah, BPC, I said, right? BPC, but 
uh, or either, or that environmental com com committee, but I can't invite to Alice's committee, but I can invite to mine. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have somebody online. Uh, will you be removing all of the installed benches for sitting on West Street outside of BMCC after Harrison Street heading downtown? The wall photos elements do not show any of those benches in the picture. The benches were very welcomed by the community. Can you repeat the question? I can. Will you be removing all of the installed benches for sitting on West Street outside of BMCC after Harrison Street heading downtown? The wall photos elements do not show any of those benches in the picture. The benches were very welcomed by the community. So I believe they're talking about benches that are on West Street on the west, the east side of West Street. Like I had said earlier, we're moving the alignment of the project elements on the east side of West Street because we're looking to avoid the impacts that were created by having the project be either in the median or on the west side of West Street. There's a lot of technical difficulty that the engineering team is working through as we put the project elements on the east side of West Street because as you know when you walk there, there's a lot of underground vaults and things. There's a lot of utility work there. So that, that particular area of the project just has a lot of engineering difficulty that we're working through and we're coordinating with the utility providers in New York City to coordinate whether we can relocate or move some of that stuff. But I would say right now the engineering effort is focused really on the ability to construct here and we can certainly take back the comment about benches and get back to folks on that in the final. So currently on that side of the street, it's really back of house for BMCC. There's a lot of loading docks. There's a dumpster access. There's things like that. To my knowledge, there's currently no benches on that side of the street. There are some street trees, though. I think the question um, may, may be addressing for when the alignment was on the other side, but now that it is on this side of 9A, we're not going to be removing any benches because there's none to remove. I, I'm just going to say to the presentation team as well as the audience, if we don't have a microphone in front of you, the folks who are online can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, there's a picture of what I think the questioner is referring to. That's right. It's sort of backup house for BMCC. I'm not sure there's benches there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, you know, maybe our suggestion is let's continue with the Q&A as best as we can, you know. What we heard is that people want to talk about the themes that we've set up in the back. We want to make sure we have time for people to dig into those themes. So I think maybe the current question format is what we'll work with, and then at the next meeting, we'll see if we can tweak it. So, yep, my question is also about this reach. Um, what is the possibility of 9A in the event of a flood? Like, would would emergency services be able to access Battery Park in, in, in a massive flood? That's a great question. So the project is going to be coordinated with the city of New York in terms of what we call its emergency response plan, right? This project, East Side Coastal Resiliency, the underpass projects, the Hugh Carey Tunnel, all of these have large elements that close off the roads. Hugh Carey Tunnel has large, you know, you see those large gates, right? Those gates are going to be closed. East Side Coastal Resiliency has a gate that closes the FDR. The underpass, the DOT is currently kicking off a project to close the... So I guess the right answer is at an appropriate point when our design is complete, we're going to sit down with DOT, DEP, and all the other city agencies and, and align with their shutdown plan because just, you know, these elements are very significant in terms of stopping egress, so they will likely be the last elements of the system that are closed. Generally, when you think of a system like this, you close off elements that you can get to that have less consequence, and you wait until just before the storm starts to close off these elements. Like, for example, you know, the one on the FDR is a very big element to close off, right? The elements 
outside of Bellevue Hospital are very big elements to cut off. These are going to be decisions that someone has to make in terms of the sequence of that that really will be governed by you know, you know, the city emergency management in coordination with them. It's a good question. So I have someone online who wants to know, can you now or in the future provide the number of mature trees per reach that you are planning to cut down in the current design? That's a great question. Um, we cannot provide an accurate count right now, but we recognize that the tree conversation is very important. We're trying our best in this project to indicate that. So like, for example, when I talked about the police memorial, I pointed out that we're going to cut down about 14 or 15 of those trees. Where we have accurate information, we're going to present that to you. Where we don't, we're going to tell you that we're still trying to figure it out. And the purpose of having the table there is to specifically dig into this and ask a lot of questions, not just about the number of trees that are going to be lost, but how we're going to be replacing them, why are the trees being impacted, what are we doing to protect trees, all of that Q&A we invite you to have at the tree table after this meeting. So who do we have here? Yeah? Caroline? Could you come forward? Thank you. Um, can I ask you about the trees? You mentioned to speak to the people, but absolutely, you can ask me. I'll, I'll, I'll First up, Peter, thank you very much for your, for your time and, and all the time you spent on this. Appreciate it. Um, okay. First up, my understanding is that the 15-foot gap is an Army Corps of Engineers requirement. Correct. The 15-foot the 15 the 15-foot gap, gap is by like 15-foot space yeah, from the yeah. wall as an as an ACE requirement. The 15-foot gap is a Corps of Engineers requirement and it's in FEMA guidance as well. Is it a guideline or a requirement? It is, um, this is something that we should talk about on the treat table, but long story short, FEMA has guidelines that are called out as such, but FEMA relatively strictly enforces them for the most part. Let me give you an example of a FEMA guideline that was strictly enforced. On the east side of Manhattan, we had a regulator that had a flap to hold back water from oncoming tide and surge. We felt that that was acceptable, and the DEP felt so as well. FEMA said, well, we have a requirement, sorry, we have a guideline that says you should have double protection for that. We said, well, if we have to do that, we have to reconstruct all the regulators along the east side. FEMA said, but that's our guidance. And they forced us to reconstruct all the regulators on each side. So guidance often comes with a strict enforcement. And that's how we're handling the tree conversation. But I will also add that, um, and, we, and again, we can get into there in the tree table. Um, avoiding the wall alignment, the project elements alignment with trees has a lot of good engineering sense as well. We don't want to design something that has roots that go underneath it and interrupt its function. We don't want to design something that has roots adjacent to the wall that if that tree were to topple in a hurricane would leverage up and jack up the wall. Nor do we want to design something that has a large 20, 30 inch tree fall on the wall and crush the wall. You know, so there's a lot of engineering common sense and best practice in terms of keeping mature trees from the project elements. FEMA has expressed that as 15 feet. And I think as we talked before, we're going to be submitting to FEMA our proposed design and having them review it. And that usually takes place as a single exercise and not as a series of small what do you thinks. It's generally, here are the plans. Please review them and provide comment. And that's called the CLOMER process. So just to carry on, appreciate that. Um, is, the is the 15 foot guideline well, actually, this is a state project, state and city project, is that correct? It's the authority is a state authority. Yeah. But so what's the jurisdiction of FEMA and the AC? Can't we just say, thanks very much, we're doing it this way? That's a great question. Um, but the FEMA has regulatory control over all flood insurance mapping that exists in the whole continental United States. 
And so we abide by FEMA's guidance because FEMA controls the flood maps. Now we, don't, we didn't talk about this yet, but remember, when the project is built, the authority's property will be deregulated from an insurance perspective, and ongoing insurance in the future will be significantly cheaper because you will not be in a high-risk zone. That's the purpose of FEMA certification. You demap it. The CLOMER stands for Conditional Letter of Map Revision. For insurance or our views to be blocked and no trees. That's one way of talking about the choice, but then could, could this I, is where I, I'll encourage you to talk about it at the tree Peter, table. Peter, could I, could I add something there? I mean, I, I think it's, it's important to clarify what our design team has been asked to do. Um, we would like for our design team to provide us with their best judgment as to how close trees should be to the wall. Uh, and you know, the, FEMA, the FEMA guidance is part of that, so they are taking that into account. But ultimately, we want their judgment um, as to whether or not a tree um, within 15 feet poses a risk or doesn't. Because in addition to the risks that, that uh, Peter just spoke about, we also have to be able to uh, readily access those barriers for purposes of, of testing and operation and maintenance and repairs if needed. So it, there are a number of things that, that go into that. Um, and I, I just wanted to clarify that, that their, the, our design team's judgment, engineering judgment, is something that we're relying on and the FEMA guidance is part of that. Okay, we have, um this is a, a, a general broad question, and there and it was asked a few times. Um, I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you. Uh, what's the timeline for the numerous parts? What are start dates? How long until they get finished? What's the expected timeline and the total duration of construction? The timeline is we're able to communicate it right now is we're in the beginning of the 60% design phase. We know that the project is going to begin construction sometime in 2025. And as the project gets finally designed, we'll know more about phasing, durations, et cetera. Right now, we don't have those details pinned down because we don't have the design finalized. Tammy? Yeah? yeah. Um, can we go back to reach six, please, in the uh, theme of walls? Because I think there's been quite a bit of thought given to the walls from the park side. But when I see it from West Thames, it doesn't seem that there's street side. And see all the views from all those streets that are impacted. Okay, so w which one are you looking to particularly talk about? There was one view particular from street, you have this one this coming one. up, that one. Okay. Yeah. That's, and then the next one, I think there was a, yeah, that. That's, that's pretty harsh. That's, yeah, awful is a better word. Um, so is there more thought to be given to this and what dictates the, the width of the openings? Showed in a previous slide in front of Gateway a lot more smaller openings and deployables. Could that not be applied here to open these as much as possible? Because you know th this is not acceptable. No, it's a good question. Um, one of the challenges we have in these street ends is we're limited in our ability to locate deployables in the esplanade itself because it is an esplanade. Right, so you don't, you know, we're building within a deck, and the deck doesn't have the ability to hold a deployable like, um, for example, um, the area near BMCC would. So, what the design team is proposing here is to use an element that I believe slides in place, and we're trying to maintain as much of that opening as possible, but recognize that the width from building to building is significant. 
And so, you know, our task is, you know, I'm going to go back to the plan view. Oh, I don't have a good plan view here. Our, our task is we have to prevent water coming from the edge of that building to the edge of that building. And obviously, we have no privacy wall to use as a, as a uh, template, so to speak. So that's why we have to extend across this open space. And we've chosen to try to have an open element here at the center point to maximize the view protection or preservation. But at the same time, we have the elements that are on either side of that open iris so that we can achieve flood protection. If I could just add, uh, I, this, this question has come up before, and, and quite honestly, I agree with you. Um, and so we've asked the design team to, take, to go back and look at this again. Is, there, is it possible? to create two openings rather than one and create and to have um, a, a larger open area. Don't know the answer to the question yet, but, but I, I, I agree with the, the uh, observation and we have asked the design team to take a closer look at that. One follow up, I think it'd be good for more community involvement to be specific to each street because everyone really worries about their own street. And each of you is different. So I'm going to build a little bit on what everyone's kind of said around me. A couple things. Um, in this case in particular, can you, can you explain why, since there are two buildings on the side, mm -hmm. you aren't able to actually build some kind of deployable to go across further inland, so you're not worrying about the platform. You've got a giant open cul-de-sac at the end. If we're looking to maintain open views, the narrow part inland. So why not move the alignment further inland, similar to the way you have on Harrison, which was the same treatment that the alignment inland to accommodate? I have four questions, that's the first. Okay, so, so to respond to that question, that's a good question. We looked at a number of different iterations of this during design. Honestly, I'm going to have to get back to you because I don't have them in my memory right now. But I know we, did look, we didn't look just simply at tying building corner to building corner. We looked to see if we can bulge out. We looked to see if we can curve in. We settled on this, and I can get back to you with more clear reasons for what we did and what we looked at. I'd also like to take a look one back at Reach 5. I do have concerns as to where you're going on the Esplanade. We currently have two pathways. One is dedicated for pedestrian only, and one is for bicycles. So along, I would like to see far more detail in five in terms of conversation with the community. I do not understand why, and I would love to hear initial, pre stop, please. Oh, I'm just Thanks. trying to get to the plan. Okay, yeah. this is the first of five. There's very little. Um, there's a lot of solid walls where you now, if you were there with families, you cannot see the lower level at all. You can barely see back out to the water. So that's just one feedback on here. The wall system is so solid and so cold in most of five that it's completely changing the nature, which includes at Pump House Park. Pump House was designed specifically to be a natural retreat from the urban oasis with views of the water. From what I see, it's 14 trees removed from around the outside of that, so it diminishes that completely, and you're walling it off from a view, which doesn't, I understand you have to find a bridge, but initially we were shown treatments of North Cove Plaza that include changes within North Cove itself at one point. Those don't seem to be included in these renderings, and I wondered why you couldn't look at something like that on the south side to be able to move the bridging, as you call it, further west. Again, that's a detailed question. Tammy, we'd have to get back to you on that. I mean, I understand what you're asking, but, you know, like I has explained, the location of the bridging structure is 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 defined by the needs of the path tunnel crossing, and then 
the treatment at the grade is defined then by the location of the bridging structure. So we had this conversation when it all started with also the moving of the ferry terminal. Mm -hmm. So my question is, was it considered moving west with changes to the marina in a dialogue with Port Authority? And certainly get back to me on that. Can, I can, understand that. Can I, can I answer that? Because I spent um, lots of time, everybody who's on the design team will verify that. I spent lots of time asking lots of questions about where that bridging structure could move. Could it move west? Uh, and it would impact the marina. And the question was, okay, it would impact the marina. Um, the, the, that's, not the limiting, that's not the limiting factor. By, by moving it west, and you're gonna have to correct me if I'm misstating anything. Um, by moving it west, there is significant um, fill impact to the water and permitting by the Army Corps and DEC to the point of making it ab absolutely implausible um, that we would be able to get the, um, that location of the bridging structure permitted. We went round and round and round about this um, the design team felt very strongly about this. I ultimately was convinced of this. You're welcome to have the same conversation that I did with them, but um, certainly we have really pressed that um, as a means for potentially having less impact on Pump House Park. The conclusion that we've come to is that it's not feasible. So um, I, again, welcome you to have the further conversation, but that's, uh, I wanted you to be aware of the, the work that we've done to try to achieve that. I appreciate that, but from the surface dweller perspective, the more, I'm not as concerned about the work that needs to be done under the platform for a space that's not, not habitable because right. it's, Correct. It's already under a platform. So the work that would need to be done, even if it was more Herculean, in order to be able to maintain the usable space and the trees and the parks on the surface that we all, that the public, the tourists, and everyone enjoys, would be a well worth thing. And I can imagine the hours that you put into it, but I'm just saying from a person who's more concerned with the top than the bottom. And then what I didn't see, REACH 5 has an incredible amount of detail. It is the most transform, one of the most transformative changes. So I felt it went very quickly here. Um, I don't feel that I understand, and I know I live this space. I don't feel that I actually even understand that the views in the images were well enough explained to be able to say an understanding from point A to point B. I apologize, okay. but that's how I feel on that. Particularly as you pass the ball field, the volleyball court, it shows one path now. So where are the bicyclists going to go? We're not losing bicyclists, as far as I understand, unless Battery Park City Authority is saying that they will prohibit bicycles on the Esplanade. We've now removed the safety net of having one place for pedestrians only and one mixed-use path. What is the thought behind that? Hi, uh, I'm Rachel. Um, we currently have, we do have two paths at Reach 6. Are you talking about Reach 5 or Reach 6? At the end of 5, going to 6. 5 was supposed to be, our understanding was there would be improvements. Sure. So and I don't, I didn't see that on the back of the bottom of Reach 5 around the marina or by Kowski, I didn't see anything that would show bike path improvements and then how it merges in from five to six. Okay, so right now we're looking at where Kowski Plaza and, and Reach 5 North Cove Marina uh, meet what we call Reach 6, which is also known as South Esplanade. 
Um, a general rule of thumb when you have a shared youth bike and pedestrian path is 14 feet. And there are places all over the site where we have a minimum of 14 feet. As a design team, we said that's not enough. So we've increased it to 20 feet in most places, except for where you're along the back of the Esplanade and we're, we're preserving the Esplanade as it is now. Along Reach 6, we do have a consistent secondary path that is the same width of the path that is there now. It does have a meander for design interest, but that is really for pedestrians only. And one of the purposes of introducing the meander was to really discourage bicycles from going up there. So you'll still have the Esplanade path all the way around on the perimeter. You can actually see how it's outside the limit of work here, and then it goes up to the South Esplanade. That is all consistent with what is there today, plus kind of that secondary pedestrian path that you can kind of see branching off here on the other side of the volleyball court. I, we can't hear you. Do you have this picture for the meander side? Yeah, we do. Right. Um, we can show, we can go a little bit farther down. And then I'm going to go to a question online. So right here, this is the secondary path right here. Um, it's at a 10-foot elevation, so it's, it's six inches higher. One of the comments that we got from the previous meeting was that we had set that path too high and you guys wanted it lower, so that's something that we accommodated in the design. Um, if you want to go through, go forward to the next plan, we can show you um, another image of that secondary path. So here it is right here, and you can see how it starts to come up to connect to West Thames Street. We have the meander. This is all um, one of the, the points of having the meander within the design is to discourage um, faster traffic like scooters and bikes and such. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then so, the art, where is the art? We're, we're still undergoing studies for the art. We know that the art is super important. It's a big part of the conversation. And so it's something that we're still looking at with BPCA. But I don't see it represented on your draft plans here, correct? That's correct. So we're gonna move back to online. I wanna make sure that we're, we're hearing from the folks who are live streaming. And we're probably going to five minutes of q and I want to make sure everybody has time to go to the tables and ask some of their questions um, before we have to close down for um, the school. So the question here is, what provisions are there for evacuation in the face of a storm? Will cleats and bollards be installed on new bulkhead structures so vessels can tie up? Is existing marine infrastructure being protected beyond the location of the ferry terminal? I don't think right now there are plans within the design to install cleats and bollards, but the same type of access to waterfront vehicles that is present now will be present later. So as I understand it, you know, th there were events over the past uh, decades where um, evacuation was performed by um, boats coming up close to the bulkheads of the authority's property. We're not changing that ability, but we are not installing cleats and, um, you know, anchorage in any, in any way. Nor are we changing Before the I use of the North Cove. Sorry. I, I just want to make sure that we, uh, Caroline, could you take the microphone right there, please? I want to make sure we get to folks who haven't had a chance to ask questions. Uh, thank you for placing the priority for the designing of the, the landscape for pedestrians. And a lot of residents, I'm a resident here, and um, I got a lot of neighbors that they are, they look good, but they have health issues. So a lot of times when we see the people walking around, they are actually trying to recuperate from their medical illness conditions. And it's, Sometimes it's very hard, like you see all the visitors or uh, that they are actually squatting on the stairs trying to find seats. So I'm very happy to see that the landscape actually is showing that you're trying to provide more seating in a way that people can just naturally, although it's a barrier, but actually you can sit there and relax. And uh, the way I understand it is we're trying to push the bikers to go back to the beltway from the beginning all the way to upstate, but not trying to 
uh, back along the promenade, so I appreciate that. So please continue to work on that because now there's so many e-bikes as well that trying to get by. It's really hard and we always have to duck away from those people. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, oh, I have one more thing about the tree shapes that um, I see that your slice is showing a very forish forest. Actually, how long does it take to really give shades? Because I remember when Governor's Island was um, at the beginning, they had just skinny tree. It, it took a few summers to really give people shades. And we got a lot of residents here, at least 9,000. So please do uh, let us know how long or like if, I don't know how the seedlings work with the planting. I mean, the picture shows nice that it's a fully grown tree, but I don't think it's going to happen when you have the construction in 2025. Great point. Let's definitely talk about that in the treaty. Carolyn, could you come over here, please? Yes, uh, I appreciate the logic, the powerful logic of moving everything to the east, moving the project elements to the east, but then everything to the west is going to flood. So what's, what, is the, the, what are the assumptions about how often it's going to flood and what are the mitigation strategies for everything west of the project elements? That's a great question. I don't mean to duck it. I mean to suggest that we talk about that and the risk of adaptability table because we've got a couple more questions and only a few minutes left for Q&A and some of the folks have had their hand up for a while. But I, that we have an answer to that. Let's talk about that at the risk and adaptability table breakout. I can certainly talk about that. Oh. Okay, I, I, sorry. Um, I just have a couple of questions about the edges of uh, in Reach 6. Okay, the, the Albany Street, um, West Thames Street, and then at the end, um, the end of West Thames Street, but, um, and Rector Place, I'm sorry and as well as the pergola. If you go back to those pictures, um, I call it the gazebo, it's the pergola. And I know that you've spoken with uh, the designer of the pergola to have a new, uh, more uh, built up with trees and stuff uh, setting. I'd like, and I would really re re um, beg that the pergola stays, but then you incorporate the other elements in as makes sense. Because for example, look at the beautiful tall trees that are there now, assuming that those are something that could stand and withstand, that should be kept, and then you can build out the greenery where the cobblestones are. So that's number one. Can so you do that? I would love to talk to you more about this. And at the tree I, table? I'm, I'm going to do a Peter at the tree table. We have okay. a couple of more slides to, okay. to look no. exactly at this. Okay, cool. But, but, but I, I, yeah, but, but part of it is why I want to have these questions right now and say it is because I want everyone to think about that and weigh in on it and mention it, it is it, what, what you think. I mean, if, maybe you, if you I, like the new thing. If I can just, because I know that you've raised this before. And so I want you to know you were heard I and um, that we, I have asked the design team to again, take a close look at that. See if that's something that's compatible with the overall vision that Mary Miss and, and the design team have come up with if it's possible to retain the pergola or the, the gazebo. And so um, I, I know they have some thoughts about that, and, but they're looking at it and they will talk to you about it. I so appreciate that and I do know that. I'm just trying to make it for the record for the recording. And then on Rector Place, I saw that you have something at the edge of the street um, and I'm not quite sure if that is, so go back to Rector, I don't know if that's part of the resiliency or in one more, that one, that, but that, no, go back. That's what it is now, but the picture where you have people seating, that's not it. Oh, it's Albany, go to Rector. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, too far, you puke, this is West Thames. There is a rector. There is a rector because he's eating across. What, the one with the scaffolding, and then after the scaffolding is what you've proposed. Is not this one. Go one more. Th this is it. That's it. That's what it's now. That, 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 that. Are those seats? So now the water's behind us. 
and we're looking at, at we're looking east. Are those seatings that are there part of the uh, protection, so you don't have to put something on the street, or is that uh, just something you decided to do? This this is so we went through uh, uh, Reach Six or South Esplanade and started looking at areas where we could introduce little programmatic nodes, and this is one of the programmatic nodes that we proposed. Um, we liked it for a few reasons. First, it's fully accessible; it's offering shade seating. Um, we also think that there's an opportunity to like have like just a small scale gathering space for some of the programmatic events that happen here already. And so that was what went into the thought for this. We need to talk more and I'd like the neighbors to weigh in more and I'll stop talking now. But because the programmatic space at the, at the Albany Street here is of concern and I think it actually blocks access, not opens it, but that's my opinion. Okay, we're gonna do a couple more questions and then we're going to go to the tables. Um, Caroline? Um, thanks. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I just want to say, just, a, just looking forward um, in terms of future presentations, if I might um, suggest, make a suggestion. You know, looking back, uh, some of us in this room have worked together for many, many years and we started at Wagner Park and right in the southern end. So we, we looked at a tenth of this fantastic 92 acres and we worked, I think we had over 10 meetings on just that small area and it was fascinating and wonderful and I appreciate it that now with design build that path is no longer being taken, there are much fewer of these meetings and so each meeting really counts and is critical and so one of the things I would do um, is really concentrate on how you're presenting. Um, I think it would be helpful with the reach situation that you're in that you do do Q&A in the future, reach by reach. Two, I would really think it would help everyone. And remember, the people that are asking questions in this room live here and are really, really intimately involved. But there are many people that would be fascinated to know more about this, and your website is tremendous. But with this park, there seems to be one missing thing, which we saw in the, when the city presented for East River Park, is a model. And I'm, I know all these architects and landscape architects work with models, and I think, I know we, I made this call earlier on Wagner Park, I think it would help a great deal if we could see a three-dimensional hole and be able to really get in there and look. And it, the, the, many of these graphics are wonderful, but I think that's what's missing. I think it would help a great deal going forward. So I just want to make that recommendation, and I thank you. And I would also, one other thing is when you do, existing versus proposed, and I know we spoke about this at an earlier meeting, it's really helpful if you see both images side by side, as much as I appreciate this sort of intermediary, which is interesting to see, I think that would be very helpful as well. Thank you. Caroline, the gentleman in the turtleneck, please. And that'll be our last question. How you doing? Uh, my question is about Reach 3 in front of uh, Rockefeller Park. I'll make it really quick. <clears throat> There's, my first question would be, when I, when I look at it, it looks like there's a setback from where the original wall is. Keep going, you're getting closer. I'll, ju I'll just keep talking as you, yep, oh, go back. Go, nope, uh, yeah, right, no, the one where you have the park. <coughs> the, um, sorry, the playground. Thought I just, uh, the no. next playground. This one. You, somewhere else. It got lost. That one. It's yep. Okay. yep. <clears throat> so there, <clears throat> when you show it from another side, it should, looks like that wall is is set back further, um, what's west, and there's like some plantings and whatnot. So my first question is, that's going to obviously make the playground smaller. Are you planning to make the playground larger going west? Because even if you put the same equipment, there'll be less room to run around. That'd be one question. And two, just as a statement, when you make that wall two feet taller, kids walking by, they basically won't be able to see if their friends are in the park, if they're playing. It'll be too high, which leads to my third point. Are these walls scalable in the sense that you build that gray wall to whatever height you want to? Can you add on to it? And if you're able to do that, because that would seem easier, not redigging, could you keep, could you build to that height currently and down the road in 10 years, whatever, you see that the water levels are moving higher, then simply just add to it versus, and, and do it that way. It would cost less to begin with. And then you can always make adjustments if your modeling changes and whatnot. So thank you for that question. I'm going to answer the first half and then hand it over to Peter for the second. Um, you are uh, very perceptive in noting that 
the wall that we're showing in these drawings is offset a little bit into the park, a couple of feet into the park, um, along this edge of Rockefeller, and specifically at the playground. Uh, the reason we're doing that, and sorry, broken record, I have more information about that at the tree table. Um, the reason we're doing that is in order to uh, do everything we can to protect the street trees on River Terrace there. So we're nudging a little bit into the park, understanding that there is you know, something we're giving up here. There's a couple of feet of park that we're giving up in order to protect those trees. Um, So that the second part of your question is the impact of the playground itself. And that's something that we're looking at very closely right now. Um, we are kind of, as part of the construction process, going to have to remove and then replace the, construction, the playground equipment. With that comes an opportunity to kind of evaluate the spacing between equipment, make any adjustments that are necessary to things that are uh, not in great condition, and look very closely at you know what fits. Do we need to nudge a little bit uh, without impacting the lawn, without Im impacting the park too much, to make sure that we can maintain that play experience that we heard many times people really appreciate. Um, I'll hand it over to Peter for uh, add one other thing. We have um, provided direction to the design team that we want to uh, make sure that the, um, the, the playground equipment there that's there now um, can be then put back, reinstalled, um, as, as Lee mentioned, because of the, the, the spacing. The spacing may need to be adjusted a little bit, configured a little bit differently. We have looked at the ability to add a little space on that west side um, without impacting any other elements, um, any other park elements. Um, so that's, that's the objective that we've uh, provided. To your third question, yes. The project is adaptable, and I would love to talk about it with you at the adaptability table. Well, yeah, well that's, that's a specific question that Let's talk about it at the table. OK, so we're going to go to the tables. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating in the Q&A. We have three tables available. One is tree landscape considerations within the project. One is risk and adaptability. And one is the project in context, Battery Park City Resiliency Projects and Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience. For those of you who are participating virtually, just stay on the line for a moment, and in a moment we're going to open a virtual top topic table where you can ask questions related to the same three topics in, with in -person that in-person participants um, are going to be looking at at the tables. And for those of you who didn't get your questions answered, we have note takers at each of these tables, so they'll be taking down your questions and your comments, so they will be heard and they will go to the, to the project team. Um, in addition, the boards out in the cafeteria lobby will be up, and there'll be people there. And in a couple of days, the boards are going to be uploaded onto the BPCA website at bpca.ny.gov. Have fun. <laughs>